Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the fifth installment of As the Prop Turns. This morning on the webinar, we are missing Andrew. Uh, he'll probably pop in in a, in a bit. Uh, but we do have Jeff Mesmer, the VP of Ranger Tugs and Cutwater Boats. Morning. We have Kenny Mars, Customer Service Manager for Ranger Tugs and Cutwater. Morning. Tim Bates, our Delivery Captain and Engine Specialist. Morning. And today, one of everybody's favorite uh, customer service superstar, Marco Arias, is going to do the presentation today. Morning, everybody. We have Brian Dickout, our mar marketing associate. Good morning. And myself, Sam Bissett. And uh, just a couple quick things about the Zoom platform. There's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your window. That's where we're reading these comments from. If you click that, it'll pop up a window and you can type a question to us. And uh, we will answer those questions as we go. To the best of our ability, there's always a lot. If you can keep them on topic for today's uh, conversation, we'll be able to answer those. Anything else, feel free to post them in Tugnuts or email them to us. And if we are to run into some technical issues this morning and the webinar shuts down, just check your email. We'll send out a new link and start it back up in just a few minutes. Last, we will send a follow-up email within 24 hours. It'll have a link to watch this entire presentation and a link to a Dropbox folder that has all the questions and answers typed out in an Excel form. So it wouldn't be as the prop turns without uh, an intro. And now, for the next 30 minutes, as the prop turns, brought to you today by Ranger Tugs and Cutwater Boats, quality cruising and real community. Okay, Marco, take it away, buddy. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get this thing started. So, I'm um, introducing myself. My name is Marco Arias. I will pre be presenting the part two of the spring maintenance for our webinar as the prop turns. I've been with customer service for quite a little bit of time now. I manage a lot of the warranty work, and as you might have already figured out, I do a lot of the gel coat and laminate work for these guys. So let's get to it. So starting out, a little bit about gel coat maintenance. Um, gel coat is a pigmented resin that we line the boat with. It's very durable. It's very hard, especially compared to car paint. Keeping your gel coat in a very good condition is probably the best way to make sure your boat continues to look good and has a good resale value and so forth when you do want to upgrade to that next boat, right? So to keep your gel coat, probably the, the best way to do it is just regular clean, regular care. We're gonna be hitting every single one of those bullet points throughout this slide. So I'm gonna start out with some cleaners. Some of the best cleaners that we use at the factory is just your regular marine safe soap. You wanna make sure it's biodegradable and it's safe for the marine environment. We like to use Starbright Boat Wash. It's really good. It's not harsh enough to where it's gonna strip your wax, but at the same time, it's, it works well enough to where it does remove all of the salt, any of the dust, grime, dirt, debris, and so forth. As for just quick rinses, we like to use salt away. The good thing about salt away is it doesn't strip your sealant in case your boat is waxed. Um, what I like to do is I like to use salt away on the entire boat once I finish using it, and then I come back and I like to do a quick fresh water rinse just to make sure that chemical isn't sitting there and baking in the sun. So moving on. I'm going to jump a little bit into solvents. Some of the solvents that we use at the factory are denatured alcohol and acetone. The main difference between both of these is that denatured alcohol is a lot more mild in comparison to acetone. Um, it won't readily strip all your paint, won't discolor your upholstery and things like that. Um, if you do use it and let it sit on your things like that, it will though. So word of advice, my best thing is just to not touch any of your things like that with any of those solvents. In comparison for removing marks and stains, they, they both do it quite well. For those really, really tough stains, 
I like to jump to on and off from Mary Kate. Please keep in mind that this is very, very acidic, right? So you want to use a lot of water. I will be jumping into the correct procedure of how I use this product later on in the slide. Please note as well that all of these solvents, all of these chemicals will strip any type of sealant you have. So make sure to re-wax, re-coat, whether it's ceramic coating, synthetic sealants, waxes over the area once you are completed using these products. That way you make sure your gel coat stays nice and shiny and brand new. Another word of advice that I have is that these things will also strip your bottom paint. So if it does go on your bottom paint, no worries, you can just brush a little bit back on, but it's just better to stay away, especially if you're cleaning up those pesty stains from your water line. So jumping into some of the tools and supplies and materials that we use at the factory. My personal favorite is magic erasers. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys have experience with that stuff, but, but it works very well. You know, you, you line it up with a good, good marine soap and a good stiff brush. And I mean, it does wonders on your non-skid. Um, it is also a very good alternative for your solvents in case you're trying to get rid of shoe marks or black streaks and things like that. Please note that a magic eraser will also strip your wax. Um, the way it works, it, it's a very, very, very light abrasive, right? Think of like a, like a microscopic sanding sponge, right? So when, if you overdo it, you will strip any sort of coating that you have. Jumping into the deck brushes, I usually like to carry three types, a soft, a medium, and a firm, right? Soft, I usually like to save that one for my glass and windows um, and the colored holes. My medium, you know, if, if dirt gets pretty bad on the white choke coat, I like to run the, the medium brush and firm for my non-skid, right? For drying off the boat, I pretty much go between two things, either a microfiber cloth or a nice water blade, a squeegee like that purple one we have on the screen. Both work really well, gets rid of all that water super fast, and it keeps your boat looking really good. Um, for our water hose, what we use at the factory is a zero G. They're collapsible hoses. Um, they're actually lined with a sort of a fabric mesh where it doesn't scratch up or mark your boat like a traditional, let's say, garden hose would. Um, being that it is collapsible, like I had said, it is very easy to store, very easy to put away. So jumping into the next slide, I'm going to run through some of the quick tips and tricks that I do when I wash a boat. Um, what I like to do first is I rinse off the boat completely, okay? A lot of people really forget about this step, and it's really important because let's say if, if you don't rinse off, let's say if you just rinse off the top house, right? You're starting to soak down the boat. You may not realize all that soap is sitting on your hull and just baking in the sun, if it's sunny, obviously, but it's baking on the hull, on the gel coat, and what happens if you leave it there over time, it can actually stain it, right? It leaves that, that outline of the soap mark. So what I like to do is I'll rinse the boat off completely. And then that way, if you do get any, any soap dripping down, it's not on a dry area, okay? This also helps to remove all of the initial salt water. Um, the way that I generally go about washing a boat, right, is from the top down, forward to aft, bring everything to the cockpit scupper drains and let it all drain out of the boat. I like to scrub the top house with a soft brush. Um, you can even use a wash mitt or even a microfiber cloth works great. A little trick for me is I always like to leave the non-skid for the very end when you're finishing off the top house. Personally, I don't like to walk on slick floors, especially when I'm washing a boat. Take it from me, falling in the water isn't very fun. I've done it way too many times. <laughs> don't hold it against me. But anyways, leaving the non-skid for the last is good. And at the same time, as you're rinsing the top house down, the non-skid is actually being covered in the soap. And then that makes it a little bit less of a pain to scrub it afterwards. So once you rinse off the entire top house, rinse off all of your non-skid, you want to come back and work on the hull with a soft bristle brush. Rinse is needed throughout the whole time. You know, if, if it's really sunny, obviously you want to rinse a little bit more periodically um, so the sun doesn't bake that, bake that soap into your gel coat in your glass. If it's cloudy, if it's a little bit rainy, you know, you, you can extend those periods in between when you rinse a little bit more. I would say, at the very least, after you're done with the wash, at least squeegee off the windows and the glass and the stainless. You know, those are the things that really, really water spot the fastest and, and you'll get staining out of them if you don't. So if you can do the gel coat that's better, it'll drive away oxidation by, I mean, by a lot. So dry it off as much as you can. I mean, if not, it's okay. It's a boat. It'll last. It's, it's perfectly fine. So Jumping into sealants, um, this has been a very hot topic lately in the marine industry. Um, I'm gonna be covering three of the biggest ones that I use, right? I use wax, 
I use synthetic sealants and ceramic coatings. Okay. So we'll start from the easiest to apply to the hardest. First, we start with wax. My personal favorite wax, I've, I've tried the rainbow and, and I just, I like using Colonnette. No, I'm not trying to get sponsored by them, but they do make a great wax. Colonnette heavy duty paste wax. Um, they sell it at West Marine. They sell it on Amazon. It's, I think it's like 20 or $25. Um, and it'll last you two, three waxes on a boat. So the good thing about it, it's low cost and it's very easy to apply, right? You wipe it on, you wipe it off, you're good to go. Um, you can apply it in different environments, right? You can do it in a shop, in your garage, outside in the sun while the boat's sitting on the water. But the only thing is you have to make sure that your gel coat, glass, decals, whatever you put it on is completely dry, okay? You don't wanna put this stuff on your canvas or your upholstery. If you do, no big deal, you just wash it off but it's better to just avoid having a little bit of that extra work. So your wax will typically last you about three to six months. Um, this really depends on the usage of your boat. For example, if you're using your boat every single day, um, taking it on the water for a couple of hours, bringing it back, let's say you're not rinsing it off after you finish, you're gonna see more towards that three month mark, you know, or if you're storing it under cover or you trailer it out, keep it in your garage or you rinse it off after every use, you're gonna be more closer to those six months. So that's something just to keep in mind. Um, the way that I go about it is once you really start to see the boat not beat off water as well, and that's when it's time to get that re-wax. So jumping into synthetic sealants. Seeing a little bit more price, um, it's still very easy to apply. The only difference in the procedure of how you apply it is you have that cure time. You have that flash time, right? So in comparison with the wax, you can apply it and you can remove it and you're good to go. Whereas with the synthetic sealant, with this particular brand, I think it's actually 15 minutes. So you want to clock yourself. Let's say you start your synthetic sealant on your hull at about 9 a.m., right? You make your way down the hull, and now you know by the time you hit 9.15, it's time to go back and start removing that synthetic sealant. You need that cure time in between to make sure that sealant has a very strong molecular and chemical bond to the paint, and then that way you know you get, you get the durability out of it. Just like wax, you can apply it in any type of environment. Um, except obviously if your gel coat is wet and it gives you a little bit more, more durability right it'll last you nine to 12 months you know, just just like the wax you know if you use your boat very heavily um you're going to be closer to that nine month mark and, and vice versa so ceramic coatings it's been a very hot topic in the marine industry i've gotten many questions about it i'm here to clear all your doubts um it was very big in the automobile industry and now that it's moving towards the marine industry a lot of people are jumping on board for for a good reason you know, the, some drawbacks of it is it, it is very costly. You know, it's a lot more expensive. Um, a lot of companies require you to be certified with their ceramic coating in order to sell it to you. An example I have here on my presentation is Glyco. Um, they do not. The only difference is, you know, their warranty is a little bit less if you're not certified through them. But high cost application is a little, a little bit more in depth. Um, depending on what you want out of your boat, it's always recommended to buff it and polish it before you apply your ceramic coating, okay? You have to have the surface completely decontaminated. So you have to take denatured alcohol or isopropyl alcohol around your gel coat and make sure it's completely free of contaminants before you apply this, okay? Um, it's always better to do this in the shop or on the hard. It's, it's a lot more difficult to do on the water just because of the humid environment, right? And the ceramic coating needs that time to cure which is why it has high cost of application and, and the product itself, just because there's so much behind it, right? The good thing about it, you'll see about a year, year and a half out of it with no maintenance whatsoever. Um, there's a lot of ceramic coatings out there that come with a spray. And as long as you keep up with, with the spray on ceramic coating, I mean, it'll, it'll last you just about forever. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, for example, with the wax, you wax it on, you wax it off. You don't worry about it until it's next time to do the application. Whereas, for example, with ceramic coating, you want to make sure you upkeep with that spray on stuff. Another cool thing about ceramic coatings is it's not just the layer of sealant, right? Just like you have with your synthetic sealant or your wax. This will actually form a hardened layer above all of your paint, your decals, glass, whatever you choose to put it on. And it'll, it'll create that durable layer where, where it will resist fine scratches. Things like fender rub, um, rub from your ropes and whips and things like that. So that's another good thing about it. So moving on, we've all ran into it. I ran into it myself. Um, the guys don't hold me against it, which is good, but you're bound to get a scratch and ding, 
you know, it's, it's not a matter of, of if it's a matter of when is what I've heard. So I'll teach you kind of uh, how to go through general repair of some scratches and things that are very light. Okay. So my first thing is I always like to step back and just look at what I got, right? I want to assess the damage. I like to get a rag with a little bit of denatured alcohol or any type of solvent such as acetone and I'll wipe it over everything, right? Just that general area. And what that does for me is it removes all the dirt, salt water, et cetera, anything that could not show me what the real damage is there for, right? So let's say if you have a bunch of dirt in there, you want to take that denatured alcohol. That way you can see if you've actually gone through the gel coat layer into fiberglass. If you do go into the fiberglass layer, you are going to need to apply paint or gel coat of some kind to reseal that area or even run into a respray, depending on how big it is. Um, for this presentation, because I'm a little bit limited on time, I'll be going through scratch repair, okay? So if you're unable to see the fiberglass, scratch is only in the gel coat, then we'll just jump into sanding it and polishing and buffing it out. Moving on, two simple steps, sanding and buffing, okay? What I recommend for sanding is starting with 600 grit. We do, we do allow for a lot of thickness of gel coat on the hull, Myself, I like to start with the least invasive method first. So I enjoy starting with 600 grit. You can go a little bit more aggressive, but like I said, then you risk going thin on the gel coat. So 600 grit is a pretty safe bet. Another thing you need to use is a sanding block. You wanna use the best sanding block for the job. I tell people you should go with the biggest one that they can, right? I'll give you an example. So let's say you, you ding the dock, it was a windy day, et cetera and you have a little scratch on, let's say midship of the hull. Let's say you're using an inch or a two inch long sanding block, okay? You're working that area out, sand it out, perfect, you buff it over, but now when you step back, you're gonna see that hull at a profile. It's gonna divot in and continue going because it's the area that was damaged, that was sanded, doesn't match the perimeter of it. So if you use a larger sanding block, in essence, you're blending the rest of the area with the damaged area, and then you don't get that really huge divot that's very noticeable. So just going back to it, using a sanding block every time, if you are working on a chip, let's say that's on a gutter or a hatch, um, you can use a smaller one, obviously, and, and it really won't be as noticeable. So pretty much just using the right block for the job. So my general procedure is I'll start sanding with 600 grit. I'll go to the point where the scratch is just almost there. I mean, I'll pass my fingernail across the scratch. If I get a little bit of resistance, that's how I know I'm there. Then I'll jump to a thousand grit. Okay. The reason that I do that is because if you sand flat with 600 grit and then you jump to a thousand, then you run the risk of going thin. Okay. So I'll switch to a thousand. That'll kind of finish me off. And then I'll jump over to the buffing stage. So for machines. Two primary machines used for buffing. Um, there's a rotary buffer or there's a dual action buffer. Okay. For this application, you want to use a wool pad on both. Um, wool pad is just a little bit more aggressive than foam pads and it'll make the job a lot easier for you. The main difference between both is the rotary buffer runs at a little bit of a higher speed and is less forgiving. You can burn the joco very easily if you're not careful. You need to keep that machine moving around. Okay. And if you do find yourself into some problems or you, you, you know, you don't want to burn your gel coat, you can simply turn the speed down. You know, it's, it's no biggie. And let's say for whatever reason you do, let's say you ride an edge or something and, and you do a burn through the gel coat, you can just wet sand it out with a thousand or, or a thousand five hundred grit, take off all the burnt gel coat and you can just rebuff it and it's good as new. So no worries if you do run into that, but just a word of precaution. A dual action buffer, dual action polisher, it runs a little bit slower. Um, you don't run into that issue though, where you burn into the gel coat. So, I mean, it's, it's really up to you, up to your preference, what you're working with. Um, they both work perfectly fine. For the compound that I like to use, as you can see on your screen, is a 3M Marine compound and finishing material. Um, it's very efficient. It works very well. It's great to the point where it pulls scratches very easily. And you just lighten your pressure up and it pretty much finishes very, very well. I mean, minimal swirls, if any. So. That's what I like to use. It pulls a thousand grit, no problem. If you are having issues, you can jump up to a thousand grit or a thousand five hundred grit, I'm sorry, and go from there. So sanded the repair, you buffed it out, and now it's time to check it. Okay. I like to take a little bit of denatured alcohol or any solvent. You run it across the area. If you still see scratches, you can keep buffing, right? Scratches from your sandpaper. 
If you still see your initial scratch, you can jump back to 1,000 grit or 600 grit and then rebuff. So here's a little question portion. If anybody has any questions, feel free to shoot them out about ding repair or anything like that. We got a few right. for you here, Marco. Yeah. Um, Doug was asking, can you wait until the gel coat looks dull to wax as opposed to doing it every six months? You know, you, you can wait. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, when it gets to that point though, you're going to have to switch to more of a cleaner wax. Um, the difference between your traditional wax and your cleaner wax is your cleaner wax has a sort of compound. Um, the only, the only drawback to that is, is that your cleaner wax won't last as long and durability. So it's always better to just upkeep on it. Um, sometimes a cleaner wax won't do the job. There'd be too much oxidation on there. And that's when you have to jump to a buffer. And personally, I always like to avoid jumping right into a buff just because you can, there's more risk in using machinery on your gel coat than your traditional wax. Yeah, I've kind of found too that the, the more you let it go, the harder it is to bring it back. So if you can Absolutely. kind of stay up on those maintenance steps, it, there'll be a lot less work uh, you might have to do it more often but if you let it go for a couple of years i know we had one question on here about the the visors which we used to do color matching visors right. um, and those take the most direct sunlight so same oh, kind absolutely. of thing is even if they do fade um, you still can bring them back but it just it's going to take a lot more work to bring them back to that original shine right so, another one here marco about yeah. uh, any risks using power washers you know, personally, I don't, I don't use pressure washers. Um, I don't like to just because a lot, of, a lot of the things on our boats are sealed, like the windows and cleats and things like that. Um, another thing I ran into is if you run a pressure washer on your non-skid really closely and you get really aggressive with it, you can actually bring up some of the non-skid. So that's one thing. If you are using a pressure washer, make sure you use very low PSI. Um, but with myself, I just like to use a, a hose. A hose is more than enough. All right, we had another one here. I don't know if you've ever used it, but the um, Starbright Marine Polish. I know we recommend the 3M, but have you used any of the Starbright? I've used Starbright Marine Polish. It works very well. It takes it takes a little bit more work. Um, I've noticed it is more of a lighter polish for marine use. So it doesn't pull a lot of oxidation out, but it does finish very well in case you are just trying to get rid of your swirls and not just the oxidation. That makes sense. Okay, looks like one more here. Uh, the dual action. So is a dual action polisher the same as a random orbital? It is in the sense of how it works, right? A dual, I'll use my phone as an example. So a rotary buffer just spins in a circle, right? A dual action polisher, what it does is it spins in a circle and the whole head swivels, right? The difference between the orbital and the dual action polisher is a lot of people think of an orbital as the ones that you use with both hands, okay? There's a lot of those on the market. They're very bulky. Um, I would recommend jumping to a, to a dual action instead, but that's the main difference being do, between both of them. It's pretty much just the style of the tool. One you hold lengthwise, kind of like a rotary buffer, and the other one is more of a two-hand action. Sweet. All right. I think we can answer the rest of these. Uh, we'll we'll type, a, type a response, so take her away. Perfect. So moving on. So run into a little bit of glass maintenance. Um, as we all know, they are very prone to water spotting. So the best way to do it is just rinse off the salt after every cruise, you know, as often as possible, even if you're on the boat, you know, and dry it off. Usually what I use to dry it off is just a microfiber rag. You can even use a chamois. Um, whatever you use though, just make sure that your cloths or your chamois don't have any, any sort of contamination in them, right? You don't have little sticks in it or little pieces of rocks. That way you can avoid doing those accidental scratches on the windows. Another word of advice, if you do have tinted windows on your boat, which is that, that mirror tinted finish, please don't use a glass cleaner that has ammonia in it. Okay, it will streak the glass and it will end up damaging the tint over time. A good example of that is Windex, right? Uh, moving on from there, here's a little tip from me for your windshield. Um, I like to clay bar. The windshield it not only helps for water spots but it removes all that decontamination especially if your boats around a ton of trees you know you get all that tree sap on there and, and all that dirt and debris 
the clay bar takes that stuff right off and it, it preps you very well for any type of water repellent chemical such as Rain-X or Aquapel. Both work really well. Personally, I like Aquapel. They sell a pack of them on Amazon for not that much money. And one of those little deals will do pretty much just about the whole boat. So going on to wood care. Um, as we all know, there is a lot of woodwork on our boats. Um, we pretty much run into do diff two different types of wood. Um, I'll dive into each more specifically in the later slide, but we go into oil finished wood and urethane finished wood. Um, the tools that I use for both are just regular microfiber cotton cloths. Um, for cleaners, for the oil finished wood, which is the teak, I like to use daily sea fin teak oil. And for your urethane finished wood, I like to use Pledge or even Murphy's oil soap cleaner. Both leave a very good citrusy smell, in case you guys were wondering. Um, good stuff. So, I'm going to cover a little bit of the difference between the teak finished, oil finished wood, and the urethane. You really want to look for that sheen. If you got that sheen and then that smooth touch, you're looking at a urethane finished piece of wood. Um, if you feel more of that grainy, almost raw finished wood, that's your oil finish, that's your teak, right? For urethane, carrying is, is a little bit more easier. It, all it takes is a simple wipe down. You know, like I said, Pledge or Murphy's, either one does the job. Um, for your oil finished wood, it's a little bit more in depth. Um, it really depends on the exposure that it's getting. For some of you guys that do have a, the command bridge option on your boats, um, you would know that your command bridge steps are teak. So obviously those are gonna wear a little bit more because you're stepping on them or you're, they're getting a little bit more sun, more water, chemicals, soaps, etc. Whereas let's say, for example, on the 27 or 23, right, where you have your door to your master, that's all raw finished wood. So, I mean, it, it just really depends on on what type of exposure you're getting out of it. So as you can see in the top right picture, here's an example of a, of a wood step. Towards the top left, you see that the wood is still in, in good condition, but the bottom right is starting to wear a little bit, starting to get a little bit of exposure from the sun. Um, it's starting to lose a little bit of its color. So the way that I go about this is, is the tools and material that I would use starting out is I would put a, get some quality gloves. I would get a good scrub brush. I get some teak oil. Um, the teak cleaner and brightener that I like to use is from West Marine. It's very inexpensive and it works very well for the price point. Um, there are different options out there. There's there's a there's two-step cleaners, right? Where one is just a cleaner, one is just a brightener, depending on about how bad the boat is. But to be quite honest with you, most of the boats out there would be just completely fine with this one step. So what I like to do is the first thing I'll set up a wash hose, being that we do deal with this chemical, it's a little bit acidic, especially the cleaner portion of it. So you don't want it to rest on dry gel coat or a canvas or let's say Raptor deck or any, any type of synthetic deck that you have, just because you don't want to you don't want to discolor anything, right? So what I do, I'll set up the wash hose, I'll put on some gloves, I'll wash the area around around the woodwork, okay? And this is so when I'm going through the process, I don't have moss and dirt and debris and things like that getting in, in the whole procedure. So once I rinse down, wash the entire area, I'll make sure the wood is completely wet. I'll apply the teak cleaner and brightener just on the wood surface. Okay. You can pour a little bit on a rag and apply it like that, or you can put it in a spray bottle and just spray it on. But just try and keep it limited to the wood. If it does get on the gel coat or let's say on a door frame or something right next to it, no biggie. You can just rinse it off. Um, you usually set, let it sit for a couple of minutes and it won't, it won't do anything, it won't do any harm. So once you have it applied there, you want to take a scrub brush and you want to go ahead and follow the grain. I usually do about 10 to 15 seconds, more than enough. Then you want to let that cleaner sit on there, okay? What it's doing is now you've scrubbed it, now you got all the dirt and the debris out of the, out of the grains, and now you want to let the brightener do its job, right? You want to bring back that natural color of the teak. Once that's completed, you want to get rinse off the entire area. And here's a little thing I want to add too. If the wood isn't bright enough to your liking, you can go ahead and do another round. You can do as many rounds as you want. Okay. Once you're content with the color, rinse everything off one more time, and you want to let that wood completely dry. Okay. If it's wet and you try and apply that teak oil, the wood won't absorb that oil. Okay. So once you let it completely dry, what I like to do is I'll get a cotton rag put a little bit of teak oil on it and just liberally apply a really good coat on the wood completely, okay? You let that soak in. 
soak it in for a couple of minutes, let's say five minutes, or if it's if the sun's beating on it, it's even better. Let it soak in, and then you go ahead and do another coat. I usually do this about two to three times, usually does the job pretty well. Word of advice, okay. If you are using teak oil on any type of your cabinetry, or wood steps, doors, etc., please, please remember that these rags will spontaneously combust, okay, when they're all grouped together. So a good thing to do is you want to get a metal filled container with the lid, okay, you want to fill it with water, put it in an area where it's away from your boat, right, anything that could catch on fire, fill it with water, and you want to leave your teak rags soaking in there for, I would say, about an hour, just to make sure. After that, you can throw them away, okay. Just please make sure you don't bunch up the rags. Um, don't throw them in your bilge, don't put them in your sink, nothing like that. Just make sure they're, they're disposed of properly. So right into urethane finish, you know, you, it happens all too often, you know, you get a little ding, you get a little scratch on, on your urethane finished wood and, and what do you do, right? So I'll, I'll run you guys through this, the way that I, the way that I refinish this wood. Um, the tools and the materials that I use are gloves. You wanna get a sanding block and a thousand grit sandpaper, some denatured alcohol, masking tape and paper. You can either use a pint or you can use a rattle can of Helmsman's Bar Urethane Clear Satin Finish. Okay, if you use a, if you use the pint version, you do need to get a spray gun and a compressor and all that stuff. Being quite honest with you, the rattle can leaves a really good finish. It's what I use when I'm out on the field doing warranty jobs. So I mean that that should be more than enough. Um, you can usually just get it at Lowe's or Home Depot. They or they can sell it online as well. You're gonna need some cotton rags and a respirator. Okay. Being that this is a urethane, it's a very, a very thin paint. It goes a long way. So please just make sure, you know, you open your doors, you open your windows if you're doing anything like this. So step one, put on your gloves and your appropriate respirator, okay? I assess the damage. I find the areas that I want to fix. We'll use, um, let's say, a scratch on the table as an example, okay? What I do is I'll tape off about a foot around the damaged area. And then I'll sand the area down with a thousand grit. And here's a tip. Don't sand all the way up to your tape line, okay? I'll cover this in a little bit later, but this is, this is a big one. You wanna be able to blend in your paint. So don't sand all the way up to the tape. You wanna clean off the sanded area with, with denatured alcohol. Once you do that, then you can start masking off anything that could be subject to the overspray, right? Nearby seats, um, cabinetry, gel coat, etc. Then you wanna shake the spray can according to the instructions on the back of the can. Usually I'll shake it for about 15 to 20 seconds. That should be more than enough. After that, you want to spray a light, even layer on the area, okay? And here's a, here's a catch. Don't go all the way up to your tape line. Just let your overspray just barely catch and feather the edges of the tape. This will allow you to be able to pull off the tape, and you're not going to have that hard paint line, that big, huge layer of urethane sticking up, because then you run into trying to blend it out to the rest of the floor and sanding and buffing, and it turns into a big mess, so... You go all the way, almost to the tape, but not quite there, and you wanna let it dry to attack, okay? What I like to do is I'll spray a little bit off to the side, let's say on a piece of plastic or a cardboard newspaper, and I can use that as my test spot, right? And when I say to attack, I mean, you wanna be able to touch your test spot, and it, it needs to feel sticky, but, you, but it won't peel the finish, if that makes sense. So once you get it tacky, then you wanna go ahead and you spray another even light layer over the top, you want to let it dry overnight. I personally recommend 24 hours. This is very dependent on the humidity and the temperature of the area that you're spraying, right? If your boats, let's say if you're set at 70, 75 degrees inside the boat and you're spraying in there, I mean, that should be perfectly fine. 24 hours should do more than enough, right? But it, let's say if it's 50 degrees, you know, you might want to leave it maybe 48 hours instead. So it's, it's pretty much up to that. Like I said, I would keep your test spot just to make sure it's completely dry before let's say you put plates on the table or if you refinish the part of the floor, you step on the floor and so forth. So moving on, canvas and upholstery care. Um, for cleaning and protecting the canvas, just like going back to the boat wash, you wanna use a marine safe soap, um, biodegradable, safe for the marine environment, et cetera. You wanna make, sure make sure you rinse it very well. When using a soap, you don't wanna use anything really harsh um, just because you can discolor the canvas no matter what color it is. You want to use a soft bristle brush to avoid damaging the canvas. Okay. If you're doing this, let's say before you winterize the boat or you store it, you put it away, etc., you want to make sure that canvas is dry. 
you don't want to accumulate mold and mildew and have to go through the whole thing again once, once springtime hits. So just a word of advice. If you are going with a sealer or a waterproofer, right, what I like to use is, is 3M Scotchgard. Um, you want to make sure it's completely clean. You want to make sure it's completely dry or else you won't get that chemical bond from the waterproofer. Jumping over to vinyl and upholstery, 3M makes a great cleaner for them as well. Um, it actually carries UV protection as well, so that's good. It won't fade as much in the sun. You want to apply it with a, with a cotton or a microfiber rag, making sure there's no contaminants, there's no weird little sticks in there or anything that could damage your upholstery. If you're storing your boat long term, you want to go ahead and cover those with our supplied canvases to make sure they're looking good. Or if you can, let's say if they're removable, like some of the bolsters on our boats, you can just go ahead and bring those inside. Um, that'll help it keep it away from the elements, you know, the sun, weather, etc. So moving on, are there any questions for me on any sort of canvas, upholstery, woodwork, etc.? Still quite a bit of questions coming in about the uh, the gel coat there, Marco. So maybe we can just talk a, few, a little bit about that. We yeah. have. Um, uh, a lot of people asking about the white plastic trim uh, around like the deck hatches and that. Um, what do you like to use to get those cleaned up? Oh, um, are you talking about like for example the the hatch for the bow ladder and the? Uh... No, like your overhead your overhead hatches, like your. Um... Oh yeah, yeah. You know what works really well on those is just magic erasers. You run magic yeah. erasers on those things and they they brighten right up. You just combine it with your soap and you're good to go. Um, you don't really want to use solvents on it. Being that it is plastic, depending on how harsh the solvent is, you, you can actually start to, to ruin the finish on those things. So magic eraser should be more than enough. Okay. And then we had another one on gel coat, um, just the, the thickness of gel coat. And I know it can vary depending on if it's on a flat surface or a radius, but, um, you know, how, how thick is the gel coat typically? You know, like you were saying, it, it really depends on the part and the gel coater. We're, we usually, we shoot it for about 20 mils. Um, imagine about four to five stacks of paper. I mean, that, that should be all you got. The thing is, it, it's so durable. You can really, you can get aggressive with it, with your buffing and things like that. And there's no chance you can go thin. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a, a background on that. Um, I have put 220 grit sandpaper on a hull with a DA and I have not gone thin. So. But like I said, that being said, on the top house, it might be a different case. Usually a good word, a good rule of thumb is just to stay away from the radius as much as you can. That's usually where, where it's a little bit thinner, if anything. And we got one from uh, Eric. Um, he just kind of follow up the best way to apply the teak oil and then how long between coats. So I just like to use a rag. It keeps it very simple. Um, it's very easy to manage. Teak oil tends to run a lot. So just a cotton white rag. As for intervals, it really depends on the exposure that you're getting for like, let's say if you're in a really sunny area, let's say like in Florida and your command bridge steps are just taking a beating. I mean, it doesn't hurt to do it every two, three weeks. You know what I mean? Um, if it's more on the interior, let's say if you're in a cloudy area, I mean, twice, three times a season should be more than enough. So it's really just playing it by ear and seeing um, the fading of the color. Um, and then Nancy was asking too, is it important to treat the oil finished teak upon taking delivery of a new boat? And, um, you know, one thing is we do oil from the factory. So, you know, we, we do have a few coats and, and kind of like Marco was touching on is, um, you, you know, it, depending on how soon after delivery or how soon after the boat's built, you take delivery. If it goes to paint, there's, there's other factors, but also, you know, our, our wood shop kind of builds in sections they don't just build one full complete boat and then move on to another full complete boat they'll build you know eight say just head components and then they move on to cabinets and then they move on to this so you might have some areas that may look a little um maybe duller than others but everything has been coated i'd say with at least three coats of oil prior to delivery right and then when we do our pre-delivery inspections we give it another run through with oil just to make sure so yeah, kind of touch up any any other areas we need to. Perfect. Okay, all good, guys? Yes, sir. All right. Moving on forward then. Um, Going to go ahead and jump into metal. 
Everybody likes shiny stainless rails, cleats, and so forth. Unfortunately, being in, in a marine environment, there's a lot of stuff that, that prevents that from happening, right? A big one is salt water. Just salt water is naturally corrosive. Um, it leads to staining. You get wear and tear from fender rub and, and ropes and lines and even handrails, you know. And then that, and then washing it can lead to water spots if you're not careful about your drying and, and what type of things you use for, for preventing water spots. So going off of that, the best way to take care of your metal is just to rinse it, you know. You want to make sure all that salt water is gone. Like I said, it, it's very corrosive for any type of metal. Salt away works great. Um, you want to make sure you hit on every single piece of metal, you know, whether that's your rub rail or your anchor, windlass, boarding ladders, et cetera, and even your engine. You know, it doesn't hurt to give your engine a really good rinse off. If you have an outboard engine, that's obviously, you know, where, where it comes in handy. Um, you can even flush it out with salt away. I mean, it, it works great for any type of, of these applications. As for water spots, you know, you need to prevent these things. And if you live in an area where you do have very heavy water, meaning that the water carries a lot of minerals, um, a rinse filter works perfectly fine. This is actually one that I use is the CR spotless system. Um, you hook up your hose on one end and then on the other side, you hook up the hose that leads to your spray nozzle on the, for rinsing off the boat. And what it does is it filters out all those minerals, right? So when your water spots, if they, if they do dry, if the water dots do dry, they don't leave that heavy mineral residue that turns into really pesky water spots. Another good way, just simply drying your boat. You know, you take a squeegee or a chamois um, to your windows, rails, and so forth, and that'll do pretty much all of it right there. And if you do end up getting any type of water spots, it's, it's not hard to clean them. You know, you take a little bit of elbow grease and some metal polish, and you take care of that. I'll go into some of my favorite metal polishes here in this uh, next couple slides, but here we have an example, right? You got a handrail, you got a little bit of staining, you know, maybe some fender whip. What I like to do, if, if it's a pretty dull job like that, I'll take my polisher, which this is my personal one. It's a Milwaukee M12. Really handy to have. It doesn't spin very fast. It's very easy to use. You can adjust the speed on it. So I'll take a little bit of that. I'll take a little bit of metal polish. Um, go ahead and give it a buzz. Come back with a microfiber cloth or even a cotton cloth. You know, you got an old t-shirt laying around, maybe an old kitchen towel. That works perfectly fine as well. For my polishes, I either like to go with the Starbright chrome and stainless polish or the Garlic Easy in aluminum, stainless, and chrome polish. The thing I like about both of those is they're actually a one step, meaning that they not only shine up and they have that compound to bring that shine back, they also have a sealer, right? So, so it, in essence, it'll seal and protect your stainless and that'll resist a lot of the staining that comes, comes with having metal on a boat. So if you do run into staining, as you can see on that rail base, whether it's on the gel coat or it's on the rail, um, you can go ahead and just use on and off. On and off works perfectly fine. Um, it is for more stubborn staining. If you can get it off with polish, obviously the polish would be a little bit less invasive. But I'll go through the general procedure of using on and off for, for removing some of that staining. So keep in mind, like I had mentioned before, on and off is very acidic. Um, that's how it removes a lot of that staining. You want to make sure you put on gloves. Use your personal protection equipment. Um, this stuff will burn your skin. So be very careful. Typically, what I like to do is first I'll put on my gloves. I'll make sure I have a water hose handy. I'll rinse off the entire area for the same reason, kind of like how I was speaking about when I was doing the wood care. In case you get it somewhere else, you want to have that water to be able to dilute it so it doesn't damage, let's say, any rubber or, or things like that. So you want to rinse off the entire area. You'll be you'll be cleaning. You'll be destaining. What I like to do is I'll take a little paintbrush, a little bristle brush, I'll dip it in the on and off, then I'll go ahead and I'll just apply it to the area where the staining is present. So like, let's say on this rail that you have on your screen, I'll go ahead and I'll run my brush on that little stained area to the right. Um, I'll come back pretty much immediately with water, I'll rinse it completely off and I'll check. If the staining is still there, I'll go ahead and I'll do it again. If it's not there, then we're good to go. I'll just clean off the area. So like I said, because it is a very harsh cleaner, it is gonna strip any type of sealant that you have. So regardless of what you have, let's say if the boat's wax, you wanna come back and just re-wax that area or else that area will be very prone to oxidation versus the rest of the boat. So any questions on, on any of the metal?
One here from uh, John about cleaning and polishing uh, the brass porthole. I know that we've switched okay. stainless on those, but for uh, for anybody that has the the brass, um, you know, I know a lot of people leave them just to kind of mm -hmm. look the way that they look after a few years. But uh, have you polished right. those, cleaned those much? I have actually. Um, I have taken a little bit of polish, and I use that Milwaukee polisher. I can go back to that slide really quick. Use that Milwaukee polisher, and it actually works really well. Um, I've not used on and off on them just because brass is a little bit of a softer metal. I haven't tried it personally, um, but the polisher does more than enough work. It brings back the shine for sure and, and gets rid of a lot of that, that corrosiveness that comes with over time. Just type in one up. Questions about uh, fender rash there, Marco? What I've been basically telling people is, you know, make sure you rinse off. Every time you run, rinse off the hole, rinse off the fenders. A lot of times you see the salt. Um, water gets trapped between those two, and that's what's causing a lot of that fender rash. But um, anything to add there as far as, you know, keeping that fender rash to a minimum? You know, a lot of people go with the fender covers. The boot covers is what they call them. Um, just a word of advice from me is whether you have those or not, you can still scratch up the hull. Being that those those fender covers, they, they grab a lot of debris from the docks, okay? And that can end up scratching your hull. So as long as you really maintain on just keeping your fenders clean and rinsing off every time, you should be fine. Um, you can also wax your fenders, and that gives you a little bit more lubrication as well to make sure that, that you're avoiding all those scratches and fender rub on your hull. I think right. not, not tying your boat off super tight either helps. Um, right. you, know, you can have a little play, I think, when... Uh, when it's reefed down super tight to the dock and, and then those fenders are just rubbing right on the boat for, you know, however long it's sitting there it can cause a lot of issues. So it, it's okay to have a little play there. Make sure your fenders have some, some, you know, room to move around. Absolutely. A lot of questions also, Marco, on the, um, the black rub rail there, the plastic mm -hmm. Any products that you've used other than just a Marine polish for those to, to kind of keep them looking new. The thing that I've that I've seen that works very well for those is, let me actually go back to that slide really quick. Um, I like to use so I like to use 3M Marine compound finishing material. You take that, you can even take your cordless Milwaukee polisher. You run a little bit of that on your rub rail, and then you can run back over it with that, and that usually brings the shine back. You know, I've tried Armor All, I've tried different types of black dye, and that's pretty much the stuff that does it for me. Um, you can also seal those things to prevent that that white from coming back too. Let's see. Comment from David, um, just adding to the fender rash. He said that he uses a uh, clear 3M film on the hull there to uh, to eliminate that fender rash. Yeah, so, you thanks, can thanks, do David. that as well. Yeah, I know the automobile world has a lot of those clear wrap, kind of like the car bras, right, that they have on the front. That wouldn't yeah. be a bad idea at all. Save your hull a little bit. If you do get that fender rush, do you just do the same process you asked earlier, or you talked about earlier, just doing the light compound and a, a wax? Yep, absolutely. You know, you come back with that rotary buffer, a dual action polisher with that 3M Imperial compound, and it takes it right off. You know, as long as you don't, you didn't have any rocks or something digging in there from the fender, it should all come out clean. And then what about uh, reapplying the, the Scotch guard to your canvas, uh, you know, your exterior canvas? That There's a question from Michael on, uh, he has a 2019 29. Uh, he's just asking how, how often to reapply. I usually like to do it once a season. Once a season is, is usually more than enough just because a lot of people don't leave their canvas baking on the boat. Um, obviously, it depends, like I said, on sun exposure and, and wear and turn and things like that. But I've seen a good waterproof in every season work out perfectly fine. So the biggest thing is just making sure it's very clean and dry before you apply it. That way you get that durability out of, out of it. And then I don't know if, if either of you two touched on it yet either, but just getting a lot of questions on Rain-X as well. Just uh, our, our thoughts on using Rain-X and... Uh, yeah, um, about application of Rain-X. Yeah. Kenny, you're, you're cutting off a little bit there. What was that, sorry? 
we just have uh, have a few uh, people asking about Rainex, um, about you know our recommendations on on using it, or if there's anything else out there as well. You know, Rainex works perfectly fine. Um, nothing against it; it's great, good application. My personal favorite is Aquapel. Um, it's actually applied a little bit differently. Let me go back to the slide, and I can show you guys what it looks like. Let's. Uh, There it is. So if you can see my screen right here, my cursor, it's right there, it's at Aquapel. So the way that I apply that, that's my favorite, is, is you take those little two tabs, you pinch them together, it releases the liquid inside. And on the bottom side of this, you have almost like a, like a foam cotton applicator and you just rub it on your windows. You let it sit for about a couple minutes and then you come back and you just wipe it off and it'll last you about a year or so. That's what I like to use. Great. We'll let you get back into it and keep going on these uh, these questions here, Marco. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. So moving on in, that pretty much concludes the presentation for Spring Maintenance Part 2. Um, I want to personally thank you guys for joining us during this hectic time. Um, we appreciate having everybody here, having all the questions. Like I said, thank you again for joining us. And I'll take any remainder questions if you guys got them for me. Any lagging questions? Hey, Marco. Yeah. We've got a, a few questions here. There's actually quite a few. So good job on uh, on the presentation. I think we should take some more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Quite a few questions coming in on the Raptor deck, Marco. I don't know if you want to talk about, you know, we have a lot of boats out there now that have that decking. Um, what's the best yeah. way to clean that? So what I like to do is I'll, I'll just, just take some good old deck cleaner. Um, Starbright deck cleaner is the one that I like to use. You put a little bit in a spray bottle. Um, you rinse off the entire Raptor deck. Go ahead, and this works for sea deck as well. Um, you want to go ahead and you spray everything down. You let it sit for, I don't know, I'd say a couple minutes. Come back with a scrub brush. You follow the grain and it, it wipes it completely clean of any type of fish guts or footprints or anything like that. Hey, Marco, there's a, Greg wants to know if you've used a polymer sealant like All Care. It's made for Imron painted boats, but wondered if it would work for gel coat. That's a really good question. Um, you have to be really careful with those type of things. Um, a good example would be using your th or um, using ceramic coating meant for automobile use on gel coat. You have to be very careful when you jump between coatings like that. It wouldn't harm your boat but the durability wouldn't last as long just because the way that it works, right, is, is the gel coat is a, has a different type of way of hardening versus let's say all grip. So just one thing to keep in mind, the durability may not be there. If you do do it and try and test it out, it, it shouldn't harm your paint at all or your gel coat, sorry. There was one customer asked if clear nail polish will take away a scratch in the gel coat. <laughs> you know, I've heard that quite a bit. It's really good for a quickie fix. Um, the only thing about the nail polish is it might not look that good afterwards, depending on how the scratch is, and it might not be as durable, right? The way that nail polish dries is it uses the oxygen in the air as a catalyst, almost like super glue, right? Whereas if you use our gel coat, right, with our MEKP R catalyst, it's, it's more of a hardened bond, right? It's a little bit more durable, especially with your prep work and things. It does work, but it's likely not to last as long as a proper repair with gel coat. Okay. We're going to take a few more questions and then we're going to have a quick announcement for those that want to hang in there with us. Uh, so let's keep going on the questions and then we'll, uh, we'll have our announcement here in about five minutes. There was, uh, there was one here about uh, do Marina's care for using uh, a lot of these products or, or kind of doing the detail that you're, you're talking about in the marinas. You know, it's, it's as long as you stay clean, you know, as long as you're not splattering compound all over the water. Um, if you're washing a boat, as long as you're not tossing tons of sud into the water, you should be perfectly fine. I mean, it's all it's all water soluble to some extent, right? Obviously, you don't want to turn around and get some of our on and off stain cleaner and just pour it overboard, you know. But if you're using those in small amounts and you're rinsing off very liberally, you should be completely fine. And I think if they're worried about it, they can always ask the uh, 
the staff at the marina office and mm -hmm. i think the only thing we've ever really ran into issues is growing up to desolation and uh and having water restrictions on rinsing off the boat but usually the the dock crews kind of tell you right away if there's any water restrictions absolutely I think you covered this one already, Marco, but uh, we had a question here from Dale about what to do uh, for cleaning and polishing the non-skid. I know that we don't typically polish just because it makes it slippery, but as far as cleaning, um, what's your recommendation there? For cleaning, um, I mean, for one, during the wash, just taking a really good old deck cleaner and a magic eraser and a scrub brush does wonders. As for protecting it, there's a lot of deck cleaners out there that do carry some sort of protection. It's, uh, I believe it's called PTEF. It's a Teflon based covering. It doesn't last a long time, but it does save your non-skid from a lot of black streaks and things like that. Um, as for oxidation and things like that, it, it really shouldn't harm your non-skid. But as you were saying, Tim, it, it's, it's very important to, to avoid sealing the non-skid as much as you can, just because you know it makes it really slick, especially when you, when you pair it with boat soap when you're washing your boat. Marco, there's one question on here that I think you answered, but it, it's a really good question. When a scratch on the dark blue hole reveals light blue underneath, are you seeing gel coat or fiberglass? Right there, you're actually seeing gel coat. Okay. Um, so the way that we do it on, on, I would imagine it's a ranger, but the way that we do it on those is, is we'll spray the mold. We'll come back with a very, very light skim of high strength putty, which is a little bit of a lighter color. And then we run through our skin coat. So what you're seeing there is a gel coat starting to get thin towards that next barrier, but it, it's not there yet. So what I would recommend there is just using gel coat. That way you avoid going that thin. And then he said, how do you, how do you repair? But you did cover that in the beginning of the presentation, right? Yeah, for dings and scratches. As, as for running into actual repairs, you know, you're, you can order the gel coat through our parts department with Richard, but that's, that's a whole nother um, can of worms. Okay. What about uh, Vaseline on the rub rail to keep it looking oh. shiny? Yeah, I've heard of people using Vaseline. I've also heard of people using motor oil. Um, it soaks in. The only thing about Vaseline is it doesn't have any UV protection. So in essence, it'll make it shiny and nice, but at the end of the day, it's still going to fade the same way. You know, it's, yeah, I tend to look at it almost like armor all right. It's kind of just a quickie fix, but it'll just have to be redone. You know, you give it enough time with the sun exposure, it'll turn back white. I don't know if you've used this product or not, but um, uh, Alan's asking about uh, your opinion on the Top Coat F11. You know, they make really good stuff. They're, um, it's a very well-developed company, especially in the ceramic coating. I haven't messed with it myself, but I mean, they do seem reputable. I would know. I would have no problem using them. And then, just on oxidation and gel coat, um, to touch on it again, specifically the chalkiness that starts to appear. Um, you know, the best steps on on preventing and maintaining or you know, the shiny boat, I guess, from Patrick. Yeah, the, the best way to do it is just to keep up on that wax. You know, that wax will do wonders. Um, one thing I want to touch on that, going off of that question. Kenny is a lot of people will confuse polishing and waxing together. Um, the main difference is imagine polishing almost like a light buff to remove your swirls, right? Whereas waxing is, is just coating it. So let's say if you do run into where you do have that oxidation, you do need to polish or buff it before you wax it. The wax isn't going to take anything out unless it's a wax cleaner. But going back to your question, like you said, the best way to prevent all of that stuff is just keeping a good coat on it, you know, whether it's ceramic coating, synthetic sealant, or a wax. Nice. One here, Marco, about cleaning the uh, Corinthian Teak and Holly carpet runners. Mm -hmm. I know that we've used, uh, you know, a light, even pressure wash on those before, but obviously a good, good carpet cleaner. Um, make sure you let them dry out before putting them back in the boat, that kind of thing. Absolutely. You know, um, they make those little pet stain removers that work really well, that we don't have to take it off of the boat. You just run really hot water on there and some good carpet soap. Just go to town on it and then you just set them out to dry. Or you just vacuum them up really well and blast the heater on your boat if you have one equipped. And that's pretty much it for it. Okay. Good. We, uh, we still have quite a few questions there, but we'll answer those offline. Uh, 
Where are you guys going on Monday? You're going back, going to, back work. to work. Going back to work. That's right. Not, not that going we have back to not my home office. Yeah. <laughs> but we have uh, we were deemed an essential business actually several several weeks ago. We wanted to we wanted to make sure that uh, kind of see where this thing was going and and make sure we had our, our COVID-19 safety protocol plan in place, which we've been working on. And uh, we're to the point where Monday we're going back to building boats. So uh, we're excited about that. We feel like we have created a, a safe environment for our employees and uh, we've got lots of customers waiting for their new boats. So we're happy to, to announce that uh, we get to go back to work. So uh, the webinars, Sam, tell us about uh, how we're gonna handle the webinars going forward. So we're gonna continue with the webinar series, but we're going to, for the immediate future, move it to once a month. So I think we don't have a date set in stone for next week, but I think it's looking, or next month, but it's looking like maybe the last Thursday of the month. So May 28th. Okay. But we will email everyone in our list. We will post it on Tugnuts. We will post it on cutwaterboats.com. We will post it on rangertugs.com. We'll do everything we can to get the message out to everyone. So you don't have to worry about missing it. All right. All right. Well, Marco, once again, nice job. I learned a lot today. Thank you. And Thank you, great guys. Job, guys. We'll, uh, we'll see you a little later today. And, uh, and then certainly I uh, look forward to to get back and see you in the office next week. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. everybody have a nice yeah, day. Good. We'll see you guys. All right. See you later.